next webinar event brought to you by Reuters Events. This webinar is entitled Connect Your Claims Tech to Deliver a Seamless Claim Experience. And I think what all of us has experienced across the industry uh, through everything we're going through right now is while this was a subject a lot of carriers were engaging with, the need, the priority, the urgency has really stepped up. So I'm excited for this conversation today because I think we'll get a lot of insights that frankly all of us is facing in the here and now. Um, I'm Brian Falchuk, I'm managing partner of Insurance Evolution Partners and the author of the new book, The Future of Insurance from Disruption to Evolution. And I'm a claims guy by background, so I'm personally interested in this conversation. I'm very excited to be joined by three people across the industry that will share some thoughts with all of us today. And then we're gonna move into Q&A. And so before I introduce our speakers, I wanna make sure everyone is aware of the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen on Zoom. Make sure you click there and enter your questions there. Don't put it in the chat, put it right into Q&A. And then we can make sure that we tee up those questions to our panel today and get some great insights based on what all of you wants to hear. So our panel, let me first introduce Colin Asselstein. He is the VP of Claims for RSA Group. He's the leader of RSA's claim shared service function and accountability for driving the organization's strategy and performance in fraud, subrogation, salvage, vendor management, claim systems, and digital workflow. And he's responsible for the claim organization's risk and governance function. So welcome to Colin. Colin will be our first speaker today. Um, after Colin, we have Jeff Say, who's the global practice leader for insurance for GenPact. He drives a claim strategy globally for GenPact, um, whether that's around services, data, digital solutions, consulting, offering to help carriers with their digital transformation. So I'm sure Jeff is quite busy these days because everyone is knee deep in digital transformation. Um, and then our third speaker will be Lorenzo Morganti, who uh, joins us from AXA, where he is um, the senior project lead in AXA Rev around their big data and AI work, and really focuses on helping to drive AXA Group globally to enhance their data maturity in the local operating companies and, and different subsidiaries that AXA has to steer AXA towards a more or being more data driven. So thank you gentlemen for joining us today and thank you to all the people who have registered and joined us for this event. A reminder again, use that Q&A function because these events are so valuable when we start talking about the things all of you directly care about. So with that intro, let me hand the reins over to Colin who will be sharing with us from his perspective. Thanks a lot, Brian. And uh, thanks for having me today. Uh, I get the lucky opportunity of going first. So I thought I'd start with kind of a bit of an overview and, and really my plan today was kind of walk you through some of the journeys that we've been on at RSA and, and kind of the way that, that we're thinking about our digital transformation and, and kind of utilizing the technology we've just invested in kind of a core underlying guide wire platform and what we're trying to build around that um, to maximize and improve our customer journeys while, you know, reduce some cost while um, improving indemnity outcomes. Um, so the key trends I think we're all aware of is this um, low cost operation platform that I think we're all trying to drive. Um, if we're not kind of keeping pace with that, I think we're, we're going to get left behind. So I think that's, that's in the back of everybody's mind is, and, and why we're trying to digitize the, the claims journeys here. Um, there's certainly a lot of new emerging technology that's coming um, pretty fast and furious at us and how do we, you know, as an insurance industry, stay on top of that? Um, in the past, and I think maybe true today, and the insurance industry is probably lagging behind um, a, a number of other markets. Everybody uses the Amazon example and, and kind of saying, you know, we'd love to have that seamless digital journey. Um, we're sometimes, you know, pretty far away from, from providing that to our, to our customers. I think we just need to be careful, you know, what does that really mean and what do we want? in a digital journey in a claims environment that we're gonna to need to ensure we have some personal touch and make sure the customer still feels taken care of in, in their time of need. Um, sometimes that's gonna be digital, sometimes that might need to be on the phone. We're also um, really facing you know, uh, some climate change and insurance model changes that I think are driving a lot um, of the need to, to do things like mitigating, um, mitigating our our indemnity outcomes as, as we're getting more and more storms. I think we've, we've seen that this summer for sure. And that's against the backdrop, I guess, of, um, you know, talent 
and the changing need for talent in, in this new kind of forum where we're going to need different talent than maybe we had before. And we're also seeing a lot of retirements in our kind of senior folks that, you know, really had that technical expertise. Um, you know, I like to draw a triangle when I look at our digital, um, our digital transformation, you know, putting people, process, and technology together. You, you need to pull all three of those levers to kind of look at this success, successfully. Um, specifically at RSA, I, I, I know we can do a better job at, at, at pulling those together. We tend to look at technology first and then changing some of our claims practices um, in the back end. We're really trying to reverse that journey and try to, you know, draw out some really good customer um, workflows and journeys and, and kind of make sure the technology fits what we're trying to do instead of um, put in technology and, and, and kind of fit that to our to our claims journeys. A few key principles, I think, that we're really, you know, using to drive that um, on this digital journey is, is really trying to put ourselves in our customer's shoes, make sure that we're walking our customers um, journeys first before we really step into our our current practices and how those are going to need to change. Um, we typically, you know, in the past have probably looked at our claims journeys and our claims milestones and said, well, how do we improve the technology and the process to, to fit what we're doing? Today? So trying to flip that on its head, I think um, one of the key things that I've really been looking at is this concept of behavioral economics. And I think Lemonade has done a phenomenal uh, job and kind of building that into a lot of their workflows, you know, not just in claims, um, but in the underwriting channel as well. How do we really understand customer wants and, and how do we help influence their decisions along kind of the claim journey to get to them, get them to some optimal paths? Um, there's some really cool science out there around how do we do that, nudging people, kind of giving them um, you know, certain choices. First, I mentioned this before, how do we automate responsibility uh, responsibly right how do we use analytics to inform our decision making um how do we make sure that we're not really just taking a, a expense reduction view first but making sure that we're providing a, a really good customer journey so at rsa you know in terms of technology i think we're looking at at three key areas so one is we've just made investment in the underlying um, guide our claim center foundation and that's what we're really looking at that as, as a foundation to build on top of. Um, we're using um, investments in data and analytics to drive um, decision making. And then really looking at um, our digital offerings using portals, apps, et cetera, to really provide a better customer experience at the end of the day. Um, Big, make sure that we're building our systems in, in a bit of a modular way, that we're allowing third-party APIs to be a bit more brought into the process. Um, trying to change the way that we look at things so that we're building a system or a way that we're able to change business rules on the fly without having large coding exercises going behind the scenes to make some of those um, swift changes that kind of need to happen. Now that's that's easier said than done, um, working with you know some legacy IT foundations and um, also just structures. But that's kind of the journey that we're going on is trying to find those partners that are helping us create those rule-based environments that allow us to, to be able to have someone that can walk in, change the rules and not have to have you know a massive IT project to, to make that happen. I'd say the other big one is just how we run some of these changes through the company. Instead of you know creating these massive projects in the past where we would go end to end and, and try to do everything at once, we're really trying to break up these problems into smaller uh, bits and pieces, run pilots, use operating pods where we're mapping technology and process folks together to, to be more iterative um, and, and make changes kind of a lot faster than we would have in the past. I think that's pretty key um, for us all in the future to make sure that we're keeping pace with technology. As I said, it's it's coming pretty rapidly at us. And you know, I, I manage a number of our vendors and we're seeing these really cool things coming at us. By the time we start implementing one, the new one's there, and we're like, oh well, we want to hop on hop on that, right? So how do we make sure we're able to pull the best of kind of all worlds? 
Um, I think the other key one is just making sure that we are working with the right partners. Um, you know, we at RSA have been working very closely with um, GenPAC to, to really provide us um, some of that, you know, horsepower to, to ramp up some of these digital journeys, use their analytics team. Um, we've done some work in subrogation and salvage space to really, um, you know, use uh, visualization software to try to see trends and react to them a lot faster and use analytics to point us to adapting our workflows to look at the high value um, recoveries first and leave some of the lower ones to later. Um, and I think, you know, you know, everybody talks about AI and robotics and, and kind of what's coming there. There's a lot, um, there's a lot of technology out there and I think it's stepping into it in a, in a, in a way that we can profitably um, make some of these investments to lead us down the right path. So we're, we're starting kind of small. We're really starting with our glass claims and our, and our auto claims, you know, dipping our toe in the water and, and kind of using AI to help us make some of those decisions and, and those lines of business that um, won't hurt us if we make um, some mistakes before we go to some of our larger, larger commercial or, property books of business or even casualty as well. Um, so kind of just to end, I think the, the big thing for us is how do we focus on the right metrics that drive the right behavior from both uh, providing that technology to our, uh, to our leaders? How do we provide the right account of it, accountability within the departments to make sure that they're modifying business rules and have the information to be able to, to do that? And then, a process versus tech alignment, I think is the big one, not running separate IT projects. Like we really need to be process um, design first and make sure that the technology is fitting with what we're designing um, from a customer journey perspective. It's great, Colin. Thank you for that. You mentioned GenPack, so that actually allows me to both kick it to Jeff, but actually Jeff, I wonder if you have any thoughts on what Colin just shared. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really been great watching uh, watching it from from the inside happen because there there has been a cultural change. I think one of the things that uh, that Colin brought up that I think is important for everybody to understand is really how do you keep up? You know, the pace of change is happening so quick, and the pace of the development of the insure tax is happening so quick that you know you can just be bombarded you know from all sides with all the new developments, right? And 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 one of the things he said, I think that you know, goes for everybody is they've taken an approach where they aren't looking at technology first, right? They're, they're looking at, you know, process first, customer centricity, and then, okay, how does the technology overlay and drive, drive the vision that we have for organization? And when you, when you do that, you, um, you actually go in a very pragmatic way to making decisions and you aren't, you know, um, in that enamored by all the glitz that happens. You actually are making your know, very sound decisions on uh, on how you're going to drive your business. So I think those are some. It is a change of culture, Jeff. Right? It is it is hard to get people to to act differently and, and kind of go against some of the norms. And I think that's one of the big things that we're really working on driving that will enable some of this to happen now. Yeah, that's great, Jeff. We share some of your thoughts more broadly and um, hand it off to you. Yeah, I, I was going to just kind of go in, in the same direction, but actually put it uh, the lens of COVID on um, on top of it, right? And so you brought it up when you were introducing the uh, the subject, Brian. And you know, I think a lot of people are really interested in in, in what's happening in claims. What does it mean to claims, and you know, and, and what is it going to look like? And you know, we hear all of the time the, the, all these terms thrown around, right? The future of claims, the uh, touchless claims, low touch, no touch claims. And, and, and really, as, we, as we've heard those in the past, there have always been barriers um, that, that are there that it keep us from actually seeing, I mean, reaching it, right? There's barriers to the vision. And one of the barriers um, had been technology. And so, you know, there were bits and pieces of technology that, that could, you could kind of tie together to create, you know, a foundation for the vision, but there was really nothing foundational there that would, that would drive it. Um, but the things that uh, Colin was talking about with the uh, advancement case and, you know, all the work that, um, 
the InsureTechs are doing has made it so much easier to create a an ecosystem that will drive you know that touchless claims um, you know advance what we found out and I think this surprised a lot of people was the adoption of touchless claims or low touch claims by policyholders. You know, we, we thought if we build it, they'll come and, you know, everybody will be happy, but, you know, there has been some resistance to it. And, and really part of that resistance was seen in really standard legacy insurance companies. Like if you, if you think about a, a root um, type insurance company, you know, they, they had a vision of digital insurance. Uh, from end to end. And, and so they engaged with their policyholder. They created, a, a, um, I guess, a relationship, a digital relationship with their policyholder at the very outset of, um, of them buying insurance. So when a claim happened, they, they just thought, the policyholder thought, okay, this is how I engage with my insurance company. It was, it was seamless. It went right into this seamless vision. Now, the challenge that we saw with the, the legacy carriers is that they didn't necessarily have a digital relationship. And so they, they may have adopted digital tools within their claims operation, but what happened was they tried to instill a digital relationship at the claims process when every, every interaction with that policyholder prior to that had been high touch. And so that was a barrier that, that, they, that they had, right? So inner in in COVID, so COVID happens, and, and, and people now, policyholders now, are openly embracing a virtual um, experience, right? And, and some are actually expecting a virtual uh, experience to happen. So this change, the COVID change, is actually removing one of those barriers that, that got in the way of kind of our, our vision, our, our, our future of insurance, you know, touchless claims vision. So now if you think about a, uh, you know, a young family with two young kids and a dog barking in the background. They're both working from home, right? We've all experienced, we've all seen it now that, that Zoom and Skype and Teams has taken over. You know, they, they aren't picking up the phone wanting to engage with anybody. They're looking for that digital channel to engage. And they're okay to use mobile devices to take pictures and create digital inventories and receive um, you know, payments digitally, and, and that's an expectation. So if you think about the impact that COVID has had, you know, it's actually moving us closer, you know, to that, that future of claims. So really, some of the future of claims is happening now, and then the new future of claims is being, um, is being redefined. So those are some of the things that, uh, that we're seeing. And I think that, you know, it's important to know that there's some dangers out there that in some insurance companies are, are, are experiencing. And, and the ones that I, I see that I'm most concerned about are the carriers that will say, when we get back to normal, you right, when, when, when we get back to normal, when we get through this, when we weather the storm, well, your policyholder base has changed, the, the expectations have changed. And if you try to go back into a new normal, then, then you'll be at a disadvantage. Right, and, and, and then your competitors are actually adapting, uh, insure techs are disrupting, and, and what's hanging in the balance there is your policyholder base. So those are some of the things that, that we're seeing as, as challenge, challenges, but I think it's you know, really interesting to see how, how the response to COVID is, is actually driving more adoption for straight through processing, and it's going to be a, a, a clear differentiator for insurance companies, you know, in the future. So, um, you know, that those are kind of some of the points I wanted to bring up, and I think I tied into a lot of what Colin was talking about. Yeah, well. and I'm so glad that you you just shared that particular point because I, I just got a message from someone this morning that was, I can't wait till we all just go back to the way it was it's like that's not happening and maybe that's not such a bad thing you need to be making those moves today to position yourself or whatever you know the term the new normal or life uh looks like whenever it looks like that again um and and i think there's a switch between carriers who are taking this moment to set themselves up for that and those who are saying we just need to pause and wait until everything's back to the way it was because it won't be um, and right. that doesn't have to be a bad thing. There can be a lot that comes from it. Lorenzo, I'm, I'm wondering if you have some thoughts you would chime in for on uh, what Jeff shared before we jump. Yes, definitely. I think it was uh, really interesting to listen to the other palace ideas. So I think the key word that Jeff used it was uh, ecosystem. Um, so it's true that now, I mean, 
all insurance companies are trying to serve their customers better by providing new tools to um, to the employees or to the agents on the field. But we realise that actually, actually we keep we keep adding on new tools and new platforms, new web pages they need to use uh, during the daily activities. So this proved to be quite ineffective because uh, over time. Um, some tools were not user and were not useful to their to their daily activities and their productivity. So I think it's crucial for the insurance companies to really build an ecosystem around claims and around all the, the steps of the claims value chain to allow um, employees first, so claim handlers, fraud investigators, uh, and the fraud auditors to really have a clearer. Uh, vision of what they have to do and to build a one-stop shop for them to oversee uh, all the little bits and pieces uh, of their activities in their respective divisions of course. Um, then next uh, I think was very interesting your, your vision about COVID and it's true that like we're seeing a very very different environment around us in the in the off coast that we're managing globally at AXA so a lot of uh, um, entities are now turning to us for new problems that didn't exist before. And they have a very limited time to address those problems and try to neutralize the effects, the negative effects, of course, uh, of those new issues. And they, of course, they um, turn to us to ask for a technological solution, which might be more effective than um, a conventional one. And sometimes it does, sometimes it does not. And of course, we are under lots of pressure to deliver uh, before uh, the negative effects, of course, offset the positive ones that actually have been accruing to the lot during the last years. Um, and uh, so, last but not least, I also think that once we're going to be back to normal, uh, and it was very interesting also about um, Jeff's ideas uh, and views, is that I guess we need to be uh, conscious uh, that we cannot go back to the previous normal but we need to be more proactive and actually work today for a better tomorrow. I mean, this might, might sound like a broken record sentence, but it's, it's true that like some insurance companies realize being quite lethargic in this, in this uh, uh, awful times. But I think that today is the right moment to invest and actually build something which doesn't exist irrespective of the situation, but so that can be offered to the customers and to our partners after this uh, big wave uh, will be gone. Yeah. No, I think I saw a question or a comment come through in the chats as well. So definitely go to the Q&A and Lorenzo, we're going to come back to you in just a second for, uh, for the final talk. Um, so you've, you've heard from two of the three. I know people have thoughts and ideas and questions swirling around. So don't be shy. Do you put them willing to share some, some thoughts? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, so that's the topic that we're discussing today. Um, I guess, I mean, I can give the, the active view. Um, and so I'd actually believe that, I mean, there's been a lot of uh, discussions around the claims analytics and uh, how this can complement uh, uh, the, uh, the activities and the daily tasks that entities are doing uh, on the field. Um, so we've been working quite effectively in this regard at AXA. So I'm part of this division called AXA Rev, which is uh, mainly uh, focused on uh, artificial intelligence and how to better uh, leverage the value in the data and extract some values for, for our upcoast. Um, so we've built quite of a number of good components for our ecosystem. And again, the keyword uh, comes back. Um, so now we are planning uh, in terms of the vision that we're building there is, uh, during this crisis to move towards uh, what we call augmented claims. So not just claims analytics, but just it's to give uh, our uh, customers a sort of holistic view around the claims process they have to go through once the moment of truth um, happens. So once a, a real interaction between the customer and the insurance company happens. So when a claim negative event uh, uh, occurs. So yeah, through this uh, augmented claim um, team and sort of vision, uh, we plan to provide, uh, first of all, again, our opcos and then our customers with the 
innovative, hopefully, tools uh, to let them directly interact with, uh, uh, with uh, our AXA opcos. So, for example, we've got some teleconsultation um, apps in ELF to, to uh, remotely um, give a diagnosis uh, of, uh, of some diseases, something that's not rocket science, something that other uh, companies are doing as well. So, we just try to add some AI to this uh, by making it a little bit smarter and by enhancing and improving uh, the way and the number of diseases that we can control by our teleconsultation app. Then another thing that um, other companies are doing for sure is chatbots, uh, and we try to announce that, especially in Asia, uh, to uh, like use chatbots in the health um, market to give a, a first level of information to our customers uh, seeking medical assistance by asking our chatbots and so then uh, give a first uh, again diagnosis based on chatbots answer before passing it through to a human uh, to um, identify better and uh, yeah deep dive the problem that the customer is posing to to the to the company um, so all this is uh, is uh, aimed at giving a sort of instant feedback so kind of uh, um, having an interaction which does not take days, uh, not even hours, but rather seconds. So um, contacting AXA should be a matter of seconds and not a matter of days. Um, and so how do we come into play, Edward? So uh, as I mentioned, so we've been building this ecosystem, which we call the Claims Analytics Portal. And so we have several components that we, we put into production in several entities in Europe and in Asia. Uh, the first of which was uh, a fraud detection tool, uh, which was pretty successful. And so we're quite excited about the results that, that this tool is yielding to uh, participating entities, but also now adding um, new services to make it, as I mentioned, a true um, one-stop shop uh, for, for our entities. Uh, to, for example, let them uh, explore uh, clothes file reviews uh, or to um, make the claim handling process much more streamlined in terms of uh, uh, how to handle images and how to use images to directly assess a uh, claim amount. So the final goal, and it's something that we had envisaged last year, then we had a, um, a bit of a set back uh, because of the crisis and because of budget restrictions but now we are really investing into that is to have our customers take pictures of uh, a damaged vehicle for example a motor and send them directly to us and in a matter of uh, or not seconds but maybe minutes um, they will get the estimation of a claim um, based on the images they've sent and the information that they put in the, the declaration form uh, for low value claims. Of course, this cannot be used for high value claims, but still uh, we are now in discussions with several providers and we're gonna shortly select one um, to run the first POC's body under the uh, to, to go into this direction and really bring a technology to the client's hand uh, on, their, on their phones. Uh, another topic which might be of interest, uh, and again, this is something which we have in our claims analytics portal is uh, uh, like we're announcing our fraud capabilities. So adding real-time fraud, and it goes in the same direction as the image I mentioned earlier. So um, what, when a client is part to the company uh, or our algorithm is able to detect in a matter of a few hundreds of seconds uh, whether a claim is fraudulent and then refer that to, a, to the fraud uh, investigating team. Um, so this will help speed up the, the fraud investigation and then eventually speed up the claim handling process to properly pay uh, those claims which are of course legitimate and then stop the payments for those claims which are actually um, allegedly uh, fraudulent. We're doing the same also for policies. So once a policy in some countries where this is possible, we know that like in the UK, this is possible, but for example, in Italy, it's not possible. You reject the policy once a customer uh, asks for, for a quotation or to subscribe a new policy uh, based on their, on their fraudulent record or based on the connection that they have with the uh, fraudulent um, entities or people 
uh, that exist inside the AXA databases or inside, for example, the fraud insurance bureaus of, of, uh, of countries which collect all the information from, uh, from all insurance companies and then um, allow uh, the companies to use these uh, shared database to match it against their own. Uh, and so this allows us also to project some policies and then clean the dirt of, of portfolios. Um, then again, going back to one last point, going back to, to what Jeff mentioned about the response to COVID, uh, we're also active in the commercial lines. Um, so we've been asked by uh, AxXL, which is the AXA commercial lines entity, um, to uh, build something which could address some emerging risks that they're facing now uh, due to COVID. So for example, we have dramatically changed our travel behavior. So we're not traveling and we're not shipping goods across the globe as we did before. Um, so now ships are, are being parked or laid up as they say. Um, so this poses a huge accumulation risk uh, that has to be assessed uh, and it was never done before. So they're actually trying to technology to understand how big the accumulation risk in each and every port of the world where ships accumulate and you might not know that your, your risk is going to that port along with 100 or 200 other ships which are there and then if a typhoon struck uh, in that port then you will be uh, in clear trouble from an insurance perspective with, with the risk that you're insuring. And, and on top of that we're doing a bunch of other stuff uh, also on, on, the same, on the same line uh, for example trying to estimate hull fatigue based on, on where ships and vessels sail uh, so try to predict claims and again bringing technology real to the risk engineers and to the to the hundred writers uh, who are um, assessing and uh, estimating the risk for specific vessels so trying to estimate uh, when a specific vessel uh, is going to file a uh, hollow machinery uh, claim because of uh, sailing in dangerous waters. Those are great specific examples, Lorenzo. And right. that actually, um, well, I, was, I was just seeing there's a, a question for Colin. And Colin, I was going to ask your thoughts about some of the, the comments Lorenzo was making, but actually it's, it's right on this topic. Because a, a lot of times in, in these webinars and presentations, it's all very general. And there's, there isn't a lot of tangible. And, and Lorenzo, you just gave some very tangible, real ways that new tools, digital solutions are coming in. Colin, I wonder if, from the RSA perspective, if you have some examples as well for you know a couple of the things that you were doing in a, a COVID, post-COVID world to digitize claims. Yeah, um, I mean, the first one that we did right out of the gate was people didn't want to bring their vehicles in to get repaired or to have somebody go out and you know assess the damage. So we were already down the path on using visual estimation um, to, to do, um, to come up with a, a damage assessment from a vehicle. Um, and we're pretty close to doing some stuff in the property space. So we ramped that up. Um, we, we ran a pilot with uh, some software we were working with, with Autotext. We also did one with Snapsheet, a third party vendor. So instead of um, customers going to uh, one of our preferred vendors or sending an IA out, to do the damage assessment or one of our own folks, we sent them a link, we walked them through how to capture the photos and we did all the estimation online for, for vehicles. And we also kicked off some stuff in the, in the property space where we were doing first notice of loss virtually with our clients um, over, over an application where they walk us around, show us the damage. And that really helped us triage, like, you know, is it something that needed to be taken care of right away and it was an emergency or, you know, something they could clean up um, on their own. We could let it kind of sit until they were comfortable for us to, to go back in. Those were the, the key things we jumped on right away uh, to try to just kick off the, the front end there. That's great. So Jeff, you have you have the unique perspective across multiple carriers and, and geographies as well. What are a few of the key things that are popping up as suddenly front of mind for a lot of carriers in the digital journey? 
Yeah, I, th- I think what's what's interesting is that they're they're looking they're looking outside as opposed to looking inside, and uh, and really when we I was looking at the question that Karthik had asked about you know what do we do you know with the digital strategy when when cash is king right, but <clears throat> I don't I don't think that there's a, a big difference right now because carriers are so focused on seeing an opportunity and taking advantage of of the opportunity that's there. And, and, and so they understand, okay, I, I have an opportunity to go out and, and look at a client base and sell in a different way because I can offer something different. What do I need that's going to, uh, to provide that experience for that particular customer? And instead, in, in the past, it was always looking inside and what can we build. Now there's a, there's is a lot more partnering, right? I mean, it's either partner or buy. And one of the things to remember um, in, in, in this environment is that it's not all heavy, right? There, there's some really light touch integrations that you can bring in that will actually create this, this kind of foundational layer for you to drive this end to end touchless experience. So I think you know, people are, are still focused on a digital strategy. Um, I think they're just looking at how they change, um, change their view on, on how they're spending on it. That's great. So Jeff, I've got two quotes from you now that I'm taking forward with me and uh, this la- this last one it's not all heavy I love that because we do tend to think about what technology and innovation meant historically which was a big difficult you know maybe multi-year don't get what you thought you'd get except the price is dramatically higher um, that can still happen but there's so many other tools that have come to the forefront that are more flexible lighter um, you know, Colin, you mentioned implementing things in pods and um, doing pilots and, and being smaller and more nimble. So it's a different world and the tools are facilitating another way to go about it. It doesn't have to be this, this heavy, um, heavy process. So I'm going to keep stealing that quote. So thank you for yeah. that. Um, there's, a, there's a great question that I'd love to just go around with because it's an interesting trade-off I hear people asking about and that's around accuracy that the move to digital means you lose that firsthand experience knowledge technical expertise and maybe you're dumbing down the adjusting process and while you might save on the expenses because it's cheaper to adjust perhaps you're giving up something on the indemnity you're overpaying for the claims um, I'm curious from everyone what the view is from that Lorenzo um, I'd love to start with you and hear if you have any perspective globally on that Yes, yeah, so, uh, absolutely. So um, this goes exactly in the same direction as, uh, as uh, what we tried to do with the image-driven claim assessment, as we call this initiative. So trying to bring digital and then technology to a very uh, human, I mean human-heavy process, which is a claim assessment, uh, where an assessor has to um, see the car and decide uh, the amount of the damage and which parts need to be replaced, or even worse, if it's a total loss. Um, so in that case, uh, you need to carefully train the model uh, to make sure that you're not missing the clear amount and the fair amount you have to pay out to the customer. Okay, so, you, you, I mean, you can be in a, in a situation where you overpay, uh, and then in that case, of course, you're losing money, or you underpay. And in that case, the customer is not happy because you have not uh, assessed the, the claim correctly. And so technology um, yeah, can have a two sides of the same coin. So you have a good side and a flip side. Um, but yeah, so uh, at AXA, you know, being AXA, quite a big group. So we're trying to be rather conservative. <laughs> so we, we, we try um, not to uh, bring technology in when there is the, the list risk or like when the, the risk is too high that we are mispaying or misassessing uh, claims. Thank you. Colin, what about your perspective from RSA? Where does uh, accuracy fall in the digital equation? So I saw another question come through and I just want to build on it because I think, you know, it's not a one size fits all journey, right? Like technology is going to allow us to apply you know, the technology to where it fits and it's going to provide a lot of benefits in certain areas. And we always get the, you know, the high complexity claims team going, well, leave us alone. We're going to do our old way of doing things because it works. 
right? But it doesn't mean that we can't, you know, it, not every claim is going to be straight through processed, you know, where somebody comes in through a digital channel, their claim gets paid and it's see you later. Um, the technology is going to allow us to be more accurate, in my view, um, in certain scenarios where you can um, be on site virtually without having to go. The photo um, tools that are out there are now allowing you to take a picture and do measurements, you know, virtually. You can now check that sort of stuff. So I think that there, it's going to really help us with accuracy, to be honest. There's certainly risks of letting claims go straight through process and, you know, the fraud aspect and whatnot that's going to happen there. But everything that I've seen, the technology is going to allow us to be more accurate as long as we're using it appropriately. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And, and a lot of that technology is specifically around accuracy. And there's this, it's a bias about biases, but this sense that because a person's adjusting it and they've done for 20, 30 years and done it well, if, if an AI is used or ML or whatever the tool is, it's gonna lack that expertise and it's not taking into account that perhaps that human has biases or they have a limited knowledge set as big as it is, it's still limited to what they've experienced and been taught. And what if you can expand that out to the entire universe of opportunities and start to pick out patterns and maybe it's an input into the human decision making. So it's not less accurate, That's an it's excellent point. feeding greater accuracy. Yeah, Jeff, I mean, you again, across technologies, across carriers, across themes, I imagine this is something that, that you face every day. Yeah, and uh, I, I like um, what, what both of these guys have, uh, have talked about. And even if I go back to the original, um, the original, you know, dialogue by, with Colin, you know, he talked about metrics, metrics and, and, and behaviors and those types of things. And so, you know, you're, you're getting that from data. And so you're going to have an entire data strategy that is actually tied to your, uh, your business strategy. So those things are, are tightly linked together. So if I'm, a, if I'm a carrier that really wants to focus in on, on accuracy, I'm going to have a data strategy around the things that Colin's interested in, total loss, right, um, subrogation, uh, tri triage models. And so, you know, which, which claims need to be triaged through a uh, straight through process and which claims actually need a, a higher touch. And, and, and so that's really where you start, you know, you start working on your, your accuracy. Um, so decades ago, I started off as, a, um, as an auto appraiser, you know, many years ago. And, and, and the thought of actually writing an appraisal from a photo, you know, when it first came out was ridiculous to me because, you know, I'd been there, I'd looked at a hood, I'd gone in. And now with the digital tools that are available, um, I, can get, I can get a photo set and a video set that makes me feel like I am right there at the car to, uh, you know, to, to, to write an appraisal. And eventually, we're getting to the point where Lorenzo was talking about where, you know, we're actually using the data from the photos to create the, uh, to create, create the appraisals. You know, our, our AI engine can already identify, you know, total loss and repairable. So if I'm working with Colin, then we can plug that into his total loss group and say, okay, let's get this out to your salvage yard much quicker uh, and, than, than we are currently now. And, and so then the, the next phase of our approach is actually driving, you know, to get to the appraisal. Uh, and, and so that's using data the right way around your data strategy and your business strategy to get the results that you're looking for. Yeah. As the, the total loss example is a great one because it, if you can identify that something's a total loss, you move to a process you'd end up in anyway. You've saved all of that expense and putting a expense aside, um, Lorenzo, to a point you made before about underpaying on a claim, that's not what customers want. You know, their life is turned upside down, even if they have a rental car or what have you, it's not what they want. So the sooner you get that total loss processed, the sooner you get them back on their feet the way that they want it to be, yeah. better cost, better customer experience, higher retention, higher referral. I mean, it becomes this customer lifetime value machine rather than nickel and diming on, you know, negotiating how much your, your crushed car is worth. Um, so great example. Lorenzo, there's, um, there's a question about some of the tools you had talked about on the fraud side and whether those would apply to more complex claims or maybe more niche or specialty areas like the Marine example you gave. Well, Again, so the the magic way of this ecosystem, right? So it's all it's all uh, starts being embryonic. So we begin small, 
looking at one or two needs and then we try to expand as, as we believe that we can serve with what we build uh, on the cloud together with, uh, with our entities and our opcos and in this case XXL something which is not only able to serve one need but rather to serve a multiple multiplicity of, uh, of needs. So as you say we started with the niche uh, need which is a, a COVID caused problem um, which of course hopefully will then disappear once the COVID crisis will be over uh, and behind us. Uh, but then the tool, since the, the effort we put into that, uh, or the platform that we're building around that, are there to stay. Uh, so now we are uh, trying to add more use cases and some more business rules, alerts, uh, for example, weather, or for example, sanction zones or war zones, uh, to allow our underwriters and our claim handlers to look at, the, at this tool and then find the answers they maybe look for across different platforms and different tools that they're paying a lot of money for. Uh, and we actually provide this for free to them. So our data scientists uh, worked on building this together with the, with the XXL counterparts and that we offer the service for free. Um, so this again, to make uh, the work of our access colleagues more efficient and streamlined and give them something they can action from day one for, for the COVID-19 response, but then we'll, but that will stay there for more use cases and more efficiency gains in the future. All right. Colin, there's a question to you specifically, but it's a theme I think we can all dig into. Um, you mentioned this term behavioral economics. It was the first question in, so I hope that Liz Walker, who asked it, is still on. Um, but can you share a little bit more about it? What is it, and are there some good resources for people to dig into? Because it is a different way of thinking that actually pretty much all of us needs, regardless of the line of business we're in, or if we're intermediated or, or direct. Or, good, I see that Liz is still here, so she gets her question addressed, and she gets to hear it. Um, yeah, so I mean, it is... It's not a it's not a new concept, but I think the term behavior economics is relatively new, right? So there's been a number of books written on it. Um, what I found was the most helpful. So we we engaged PwC at first, and, and we did a, we did a project with them, and and they really kind of opened my eyes up to the potential and also the organizations that are using um, behavior economics and and the value a very small um, just changes in how you would change your scripting or your letters and whatnot and kind of what that has been able to drive. I started really looking at Lemonade. Um, one of their um, executives there is a behavioral scientist and there's a lot of YouTube videos out there that really walk through how they've taken behavior economics principles and put that into really their online digital journeys. And they start to call out, you know, why they're um, asking for you to um, sign off that you're not going to be fraudulent at the beginning of a claim versus the end. And they found that, you know, you're less likely to give a dishonest answer if you've up front already kind of said you will be honest versus being dishonest and kind of signing, signing that you haven't at the end. There's like 50 examples on YouTube um, with the, the digital screens and the walkthrough on a, a claims process. And I found that so invaluable thinking about our own journeys and how we could use little nudges to get, um, to get customers into a, a, a better place. And there, it seems like very small points actually, but if you're playing into the way the human mind works and our behaviors works, you can elicit quite a strong change in the outcome. Exactly. Um, oh, it is really fascinating. So Liz, I hope that that's a valuable lead. You can hit up YouTube and start binge watching lots of interesting uh, interesting videos out there. Jeff, is that something that comes into some of the work that you guys do from a, a design and consulting standpoint, helping carriers to see the, the sort of the mindset of the customer? Yeah, and we, we, we actually do that a lot on uh, when we're creating like the communication um, journey part of it, right? So, so we want, want to understand, you know, what relationship the, the, the client has with their customer what relationship the client wants to have with their customer and then we start you know kind of setting up guardrails uh, on on how we want uh, how we want to manage that 
you know, and the example that, uh, that Colin gave on the on the letters, I, I, I kind of laughed because, you know, several years ago, we used to send out customer satisfaction letters on the claims process. And the first thing at the top of the customer satisfaction letter was, you know, you've been, you've been paid and it would be a violation for, you know, whatever to accept payment on a fraudulent claim. But we really just wanted to understand what, how their experience was. You wouldn't believe the amount of returned uh, claims payments that we received just by having that one that one line there. And so it's something that's been going on uh, a while, but we uh, we continue to drive it and uh, and work it into our uh, into the processes and the communication strategy that we have with the uh, with the customer base. That's really interesting. Um, I do. I want to ask something that you know we've been very tools and customer focused or market focused. Um, Colin, you made a comment as you talked about breaking things up into smaller projects, working in pods or operating pods, um, breaking things down. It sounded very collaborative. And that's the other piece of the puzzle in this environment is a lot of us are remote, have been for a while, and for many of us, we will continue to be. And some carriers are making decisions about kind of permanently going work from home or allowing much more flexibility. I'm curious how that's playing out in a more modern, digital, um, nimble, agile kind of way, we tend to need more collaboration. And while there's great tools for that, I'm curious what the impact has been to your organizations and if you've discovered some secret sauce for keeping that collaboration going because we can't just stop this work or just have everything be a single person, you know, sole contributor project that somehow gets put back together later. Um, Lorenzo, can you, can you share from your experience? We'll go around. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, um, so we, we are in the in the big group operations family at AXA, so which is composed of uh, several thousand people. I think it's three to four thousand people across the world. So, in, based in Paris, Malaysia, and the Philippines mainly, but also in in, in each and every country, you've got small team. So, of course, it was kind of a big bang from day one. We had to all go in teams, and we know that the first, the first day teams collapsed because too many people were connected to teams. Um, so it worked pretty well, to be honest, because we're all ready to use the, to be agile. Uh, and by agile, of course, not just the methodology, but just being very nimble. And so a lot of people were already teleworking from home or just working from elsewhere, or our team is spread across three different offices around the world. So for us, it was not a big deal to adapt to the new normal in terms of uh, um, using technology to be uh, face-to-face or close to your, to your team members. But it's true that uh, on the flip side, that some entities uh, that we were discussing with struggled a lot um, to go from the office-based uh, interactions to uh, digital ones uh, based on the on the on Max of Teams or Zoom or, or whatever. So um, let's say I think it's because of a, a bit back planning. So it was not planned before. So they realised that they were not ready and they had to be ready in very in a very limited time. Um, so I have to say that for us it worked pretty well. But yeah, at the beginning we struggled to to follow projects, initiatives and touch base with some entities, especially in Europe, I have to say, that we're not used to work in a collaborative space uh, remotely. So I'm glad things are, are going smoother then. Uh, Colin, how about for you? I mean, you are the one who brought up these sort of small collaborative groups to begin with. Yeah, I, 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 I would, I think it's a challenge, right? Like as human beings, uh, you know, it was easy for us in an office setting to bump into people, have those little organic conversations, you know, meet people from outside of your department. You know, now you kind of really have to put yourself out there um, and really try to seek those opportunities. And I think organizations really need to consider um, providing better frameworks to allow that to happen, right? So we've kicked around some ideas of, um, you know, we've been looking at things like crowdsourcing and whatnot, but like, how do you crowdsource within your own organization? How do you know skill, what skill sets are available to be able to help you solve those problems? And oftentimes you just really look in your own little silo to see, oh, do I have that? But, uh, you know, we're in global organizations or, you know, you know, multinational organizations. The skill sets are usually there. It's just hard to find them. 
So that's the thing that we're trying to, to figure out a better approach on. You know, how do we, how do we set ourselves um, time to network, to, to get people and our brand out there and, and our skill set? And then how do we just put these little pods together better? The skill set's there, but it's very hard to connect them at the moment. So that's the challenge I think we're, we're trying to solve. Yeah. Um, so while there may not be a magic bullet, at least knowing you're not alone, right? We're all trying to figure these things out. Jeff, you've, you've probably got two different perspectives on this from your own internal experience with Gempack, but then also what you're observing across your client base. Yeah, I think um, we, we underestimate how hard collaboration really is, right? It, uh, I think when, when this first started, you know, Colin made a, a point earlier about failing fast. I mean, we, 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 we failed fast on, on how we engage with our clients because it, it, we found out really quickly it wasn't about just getting everybody on Zoom and having a conversation, right? Collaboration had to be purpose-driven. You had to have a purpose to what you were trying to uh, what you were trying to do, and, and so we found that we spent much more time planning, uh, much more time thinking about how we wanted to run uh, you know workshops and discussions than than we did actually spending time on the Zoom call, and, and which was which was really interesting to us because it did take effort. Um, to to think about the collaboration and make it and make it make it successful, and so it's just been an iterative process for us, and uh, and we've we've actually started pushing that kind of that kind of work culture into our um, into our clients, so they understand you know, understand it as well, and don't just go into these meetings thinking that uh, the the thirty minute Zoom call is going to solve the problems. Yeah, they may create other problems for us as well. Uh, especially yeah. if the folks we're collaborating with in our homes that are now our coworkers, the cats and dogs and children and spouses. Um, this is uh, this has been great. We've gotten through a lot of questions, and that's a testament uh, not just to the panelists but to the folks who tuned in for this. That um, there was a really good flow of questions, and there's more that unfortunately we don't have time for. Um, but I would call out a few of the themes maybe for people to think about is the use of a lot of these AI ML photo based tools in multiple different ways. So not just in adjusting, but in identifying fraud um, and, uh, and using it in, you know, it didn't come up because this is claims focused, but underwriting and risk assessment and risk engineering, there's a lot of ways that a lot of these tools can start to impact us. And the nature of AI and ML is that the more you use them, the better they get. So you, you do need to start at some point. And as Jeff was saying before, it doesn't have to be heavy. Or you can start and play around and say, I told you I was going to keep using that quote. Um, and, and other questions about, you know, where, where does blockchain come in? As much as lemonade is a buzzword these days, um, blockchain was certainly a buzzword in maybe 2016, 17, and, and it still hasn't been as pronounced as maybe some of us expected it to be. But claims is an area where there's starting to be some talk about blockchain and some applications, subrogation, for example, and uh, reconciliation across carriers. So there's things brewing right now that maybe we've been talking about for a while that all of a sudden um, carriers are starting to act on. So it's an interesting time. And this conversation was great. There's some really good specific um, ideas that people are working with, some of the honest struggles and some of the areas where it's going well. So I appreciate the three of you for sharing so much today and for everybody who tuned in, shared questions. I would like to say, because we have Lorenzo here, um, for those of you in Europe or with a European focus in your business, you would want to register for Connected Claims Europe, which is August 18th and 19th. Um, because it's a virtual event, it's now free, which is fantastic. I've been going to Connected Claims USA for years. It's incredibly valuable. I know the European one is as well. Um, and Lorenzo gave us a little sneak peek at the kinds of things you will get into there because he'll be one of the speakers there as well. So um, if you're in or focus on the European market and you're in the claims world, absolutely register for the event, August 18th, 19th, and you can find out more at insurancenexus.com. Um, thank you to everybody for joining today. Jeff, Colin, Lorenzo, fantastic insights, and to all the people who tuned in and asked really good questions. Really appreciate everybody's time today. Thank you. Yeah, thanks guys. Thank you.